So we look at actinomycetes, um, and actinomycetes are a large group of organisms which are slender, filamentous, and fungal-like, hence the word mycetes, because mycology is the study of fungi, so mycetes comes from that word. Um, and the filaments may fragment, and single cells may be seen as cocci bacilli, which is why it's important uh, preparation during gram staining. You may fragment the filaments and think that you're looking at cocci or bacilli. They're gram positive. And the genus Nocardia also is a weakly acid fast. So it has some mycolic acids like the mycobacterium, but not as a large percentage as in the mycobacterium. They are non motile, they do not have capsules, and they do not also form spores. So the large family are the actinomycetes, and we classify them um, further on the ability to grow either aerobically or anaerobically. So for the anaerobic actinomycetes, we have actinomyces, we have bifidobacterium, eubacterium, and then you have the aerobic actinomycetes where we have nocardia, streptomyces, and actinomadura. There are many more, but these are the ones that are of medical importance that you need to remember. So let's look at the anaerobic actinomycetes. We have already said that these will include the genera actinomyces, bifidobacterium, and eubacterium. And these are the species. The ones that are in bold are what you need to remember. Actinomyces israeli and actinomyces meieri. The others have been isolated, but not as important. Just make sure that at least remember the two um, species that are in bold. So what are actinomyces? Or what's the genus actinomyces? These are anaerobic gram-positive bacteria. So either facultative anaerobes or strict anaerobes. And we've already said that they have branching filament as rods. They are not acid fast and they are slow growers. Like when you come to study mycology, you realize the fungi are very slow growing. And so we assume anything with a fungal-like characteristic will also be slow growing. They are also normal flora, mainly found in the oropharynx, the gastrointestinal tract, and the urogenital tracts. So the actinomyces have delicate filamentous forms or hyphae. When you study fungi again, you realize that they have hyphae. So in clinical specimen or when isolated in culture, now these are true bacteria in as much as they are fungal like they are true bacteria because they lack mitochondria and a nuclear membrane. So the genetic material, the chromosomal genetic material is found in the nucleoid. They reproduce by fission and they're also inhibited by penicillin. Remember penicillin's mode of action is inhibition of cell wall, bacterial cell wall synthesis. And so we do not use antifungals because they do not have the characteristic makeup for the anti, for the fungi. So that's what makes them true bacteria. There are more than 30 species, but as I said, the medically important ones are not, not all of them are of medical importance. And why are they important medically? Is because they produce chronic, slowly developing infections. So what are these clinical manifestations? The most important one is cervical facial actinomycosis. As it's written there, it's the most frequent clinical form. It's sometimes referred to as a lumpy jaw syndrome. How does it present? So patients will have abscesses, will also be mandibular osteomyelitis, and they can disseminate to distant organs, for example, the brain, the lungs, and the digestive tract if they get into the bloodstream. So what are the predisposing conditions for cervical facial actinomycosis? Uh, poor oral hygiene. Remember, we said that these are normal flora in the oropharynx, but also oral mucosa trauma. And the trauma um, causing a breach of the mucosa will uh, lead to the bacterium getting into the bloodstream and can get either a local infection or can be disseminated through the bl bloodstream to distant organs. So what areas are most commonly affected in cervical facial actinomycosis? The upper uh, mandible, 50% of the cases, the cheek in 15%, the chin 15%, and also the submaxillary ramus and the angle at about, in about 10% of the cases. 
what will the patients present with? We say these are slow growers who are slowly progressive painless mass, which in, evolves into multiple abscesses, which have their draining sinus tracts on the skin. And in advanced uh, stages, because they have grown and so are causing pressure on the surrounding um, tissues, then you'll have pain. You may have pain and trismus. So those are diagrams showing cervical facial antimycosis, actinomycosis. And on the right, that is a view from the nasal passages or the nostrils showing the characteristic um, sulfur-like or the yellow-like granules of actinomycosis. Now the second presentation is the genital urinary tract actinomycosis which is the second most frequent clinical form. And it has been found to, uh, mostly in women using an intrauterine device. So if infection control procedures were not properly followed during insertion, then the woman can end up with pelvic actinomycosis. So what do these women present with? A genital mass, there may or may not be fever. Fever not usually present unless you have a, a peritonitis, so a secondary bacterial infection that's causing a fever. And this is an example of an abdominal CT scan from a woman who had um, a genital actinomycosis. So peritoneal effusion, this is what they found, peritoneal effusion and heterogeneous pelvic mass surrounding an intrauterine device that's in um, the first film. And the abscesses can be seen in the second film corresponding with pelvic actinomycosis. Then you have res respiratory tract actinomycosis, which can be pulmonary or bronchial or laryngeal. And the main uh, mode of infection or transmission is from aspiration. This is common with Smokers with poor oral hygiene. Remember, we said that these are normal flora in the oral pharynx. Also in pre-existing dental disease, alcoholism, chronic lung disease, can also be direct or indirect extension from the cervical facial infection. What do these patients present with? They may have a mild fever, weight loss, productive cough. They may have hemoptysis in some cases dyspnea and chest pain. So you see very similar to what you'd think about your first thought maybe uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. So it's important to also take a social history, drug use history in these cases. So other manifestations, extrafacial bone and joint actinomycosis, gastrointestinal tract actinomycosis, and the most commonly involved um, species is actinomyces israeli then you have the central nervous system actinomycosis where the patient can present with an abscess a brain abscess but how does this happen it could be hematogenous spread from the lungs can also be contiguously from cervical facial actinomycosis where they do not get treatment in time but also following penetrating head injury so that there's introduction of the actinomycetes directly into the central nervous system. And what's the pathology of actinomycosis? The most important one is tissue invasion. So we say that this is a chronic granulomatous um, infection, which is characterized by the formation of tiny clumps, which are usually sulfur granules. So to describe the granules further, there's, they're usually about 0 0.1 to 1 millimeter in diameter. And these are formed by internal tangle of the mycelial fragments. Remember, we said that these are filamentous bacteria. And so the tangling of that, of those filaments, or those mycelial fragments are what cause the granules. There's also a rosette of peripheral clubs. And these are usually stabilized by a protein polysaccharide complex. And the purpose of granule formation is to inhibit phagocytosis. Because in this form, then they become too large to be phagocytosed by the phagocytic cells. So this is a diagram showing a sinus and a sulfur granule from the sinus. 
So how do we diagnose actinomycosis or actinomyces in the lab? What will your specimen be? Depends on what your patient has come with. So if it's an abscess and the content of the abscess, if it's a discharge, then a content of the discharge, bronchial secretions or biopsy material, culture. These are um, bacteria, so blood agar, and they're slow growing. And the, the average time to production of growth, visible growth on uh, blood agar or chocolate blood agar is about five to seven days. But some may be very slow, up to 15 to 20, 20 days. Incubation, 35 to 37. And remember, we are talking about the anaerobic actinomycetes, so anaerobic conditions. You should be able to describe how you um, achieve anaerobiasis in a routine lab. So what are the colonies like? They are small, cream or white with a rough nodular surface. And they've sometimes been referred to as the molar tooth colonies. And of course, you go ahead to do a gram stain and what do you expect to find? Gram positive branching filamentous rods. With the exception of uh, Actinomyces meieri, which is small and non-branching. So you might think that you're dealing with gram positive bacilli. And hence, a clinical history is important. How long did it take to culture? So remember, these are slow growing. So you not think about the other gram positive rods. So on the left, those are the characteristic molar tooth appearance of the colonies. That's blood agar. And on the right are the gram positive branching filamentous rods. Other test serology has been done. So this is either antigen detection or antibody detection. And of course, you can do a PCR to detect the presence of the genome. So what's the treatment? So you'll have both supportive treatment and uh, antimicrobial treatment because you need to drain the abscess. Sometimes surgical debridement may be necessary. And actinomyces are generally susceptible to penicillins, but there are those with penicillin allergies then you would have to think about alternatives. So carbapenems, macrolides, clindamycin have all been used. So let's look at the others, bifidobacterium and eubacterium. And these are some of the species in these um, two genera. These are normal um, flora of the gastrointestinal tract, but they're also potential opportunistic pathogens also important during lab work because you can't present contaminants, insignificant contaminants. The gastrointestinal tract is very rich in the bifidobacterium and eubacterium. But the other thing is, uh, yeah, so when looking at the normal flora, the microbiome of the genital um, gastrointestinal tract, they have also been um, looked at, but really not very important medically. Then, so we look at the aerobic actinomycetes. We have three important uh, genera, Nocardia, Streptomyces, and Actinomadura. So Nocardia, the most important species in this genus is Nocardia asteroides and Brasiliensis. And then you also have the others which have been isolated in some conditions, abscessus, nova, and africana. But what you need to remember are nocardia asteroides and nocardia brasiliensis. So what are the general characteristics? These are gram-positive bacilli. Again, they are strict aerobes. And they have the microscopic appearance of branching hyphae. Remember, these are fungal-like bacteria. Many species have been uh, described, but not all of them are of medical importance. And they possess short chain mycolic acids, about 50 to 62 carbon atoms, which is less than those that you find with the mycobacteria. Now, they're also saprophytes, so it'll be found in fresh and salt water, in soil, in dust, in decaying vegetation, and decaying fecal deposits from animals. And so transmission is by inhalation because these are ubiquitous in the environment. Inhalation of airborne spores are also mycelial fragments from environmental sources. Now, what are the virulence factors? The ability to resist phagocytosis. As we come to learn in mycology, the formation of hyphae is an important virulence factor 
because they are too large to be phagocytose. But they also possess catalase and superoxide dismatase. That's why they are able to survive in the presence of oxygen. But they are also able to survive and replicate in macrophages. How do they do this? By preventing the fusion of the phagosome and the lysosome. They also have a code factor. Remember mycobacterium. Mycobacteria also have a code factor, which prevents the fusion of the phagosome and the lysosome. And they're also able to prevent the acidification of the phagosome. Remember, the acid molecules are important in the killing of um, the pathogens. And they also avoid acid phosphatase-mediated killing by metabolic utilization of the enzyme, as carbon. So what are the clinical manifestations? There are some predisposing factors. So these are pathogens of um, mostly immunosuppressed individuals. So underlying chronic lung disease, COPD, asthma, and others, drug-induced systemic immunosuppression. This could be post-organ transplantation, chronic granulomatous disease. I'm sure you've learned this in immunology diabetes, HIV, and other immunosuppressive conditions. So what are the clinical manifestations of nocardia? We have pulmonary nocardiosis, which is subacute or indolent. What does a patient present with? Cough, sick, parulent sputum, fever, weight loss, and malaise, very similar to what you'd see in TB. Then you also have the extrapulmonary nocardiosis, and this usually results from hematogenous spread from either an asymptomatic uh, focus or a healed pulmonary site. There can also be local extension from the lungs to the surrounding structures so that you end up with purulent pericarditis. You can also have mediastinitis. You can also have others on the skin, subcutaneous tissues, and the central nervous system. The third manifestation is a primary cutaneous disease. Now, this is a disease of immunocompetent hosts. The others are immuno, um, suppressive, suppressed hosts. And Nocardia brasiliensis is responsible for this in up to 80% of cases. This is a lymphocutaneous infection with superficial cellulitis and localized abscess. And there may be mycetoma um, a mycetoma at the late stage of infection. So what does this mycetoma present as? This is a chronic, localized, so slowly progressive and often painless subcutaneous and bone disease. In most cases, it, is, it involves the foot. And this is because the main mode of transmission, remember these are immunocompetent hosts, is through traumatic inoculation. We say, that, we say that nocardia is ubiquitous in nature, so barefoot, uh, mostly farmers or people working in the fields, barefoot or herding uh, livestock. Traumatic inoculation, maybe through a thorn, it's introduced into the subcutaneous tissue. And that is what it looks like. This is a mycetoma stage. So how do we diagnose nocardia in the lab? So it depends on what the patient presents with. If it's pulmonary nocardiosis, bronchial, uh, bronchial washings, bronchial lavage, fluids, sputum, if they're able to give us sputum specimen, abscesses, drain the wounds, tissues, or if it's CNS, then you need a CSF sample. Macroscopic examination is important. Remember, you're looking for the granules and also a gram stain or a modified acid fast stains, partially acid fast filamentous bacilli. Because if you decolorize too aggressively when doing the gram stain, they'll actually look that like they're gram negative. So the decolorization step when gram staining is very important. So how do we culture? They grow on most non-selective lab media. Depending on the strain, colonies may take from two days to two weeks. So you may be able to observe macroscop uh, macroscopically the area of hyphae. Now this, you will learn how to look at the hyphae when you're doing mycology. 
Colonial morphology usually is variable. They may be smooth and bacterium-like, that's in Nocardia fascinica. In other species, there's a chalky white appearance in most of the other species of Nocardia. For identification, biochemical tests, for example, hydrolysis of adenine, casein, tyrosine, xanthine, and hypoxanthine, API, which is the antigen profiling index. Serology also can be used and molecular, um, molecular procedures like PCR can also be used for identification. And these are to the top, that's chocolate blood agar with the characteristic chalky white appearance of the colonies to the right, top right gram positive filamentous bacteria rods in this case. At the bottom is a modified acid fast bacilli, um, acid fast procedure. So you can see the characteristic red appearance of the filamentous bacteria. So what's the treatment? The treatment of choice is uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, but others can also be used, amikacin, ceftriaxone, imipenem. In serious disease and combination therapy is used. And these are cases of CNS and involvement and also dissemination, disseminated disease. Okay. Are we still together? Okay. So let's look at streptomyces and actinomadira. We are still looking at the aerobic actinomycetes. So for streptomyces, the most important species is streptomyces somaliensis. So named because it was first isolated from Somalia or in Somalia. Then we have these are saprophytic soil, uh, organisms. So yeah, they, they are ubiquitous in the environment and they cause mycetoma. Now these are actinomycetoma because when you do mycology, you'll also find um, species or genera of uh, fungi that cause mycetoma. We refer to the fungal mycetoma as U mycetoma and refer to those caused by bacteria as actinomycetoma. Now, there have been few cases of invasive disease, but usually these will be where uh, the host is immunosuppressed, severely immunosuppressed, in cases of cancer, HIV, but also in cases where medical devices are introduced into the body without following infection, strict infection control procedures. The diagnosis usually requires microscopic and pathological correlation to rule out contamination. Now, because these are ubiquitous found in the environment, they have been found, they are important contaminants of our cultures in the lab, but also during, um, during sample collection. So usually it's both what's the patient presenting with and also what are we finding in the lab. So for actinomadura, we have actinomadura madure, and Actinomadira pelletieri. Now, these are also soil saprophytes and they cause mycetoma. Okay, and we'd already described what mycetoma looks like in the previous slide when we looked at uh, Nocardia. So they really look exactly the same. The clinical presentation will be exactly the same. 